What's absolutely clear is that individuals can't solve this by themselves. On the other hand, I think the idea that, well, governments have got to solve this, so let's just wait for governments to act, is kind of for the birds as well. That's not how politics works. Hello, and welcome to season two of Conversations on Climate, the podcast series which has been developed in partnership with the London Business School's Alumni Energy Club, in which I've been leading a series of conversations with experts from around the world exploring the biggest challenge of our time, climate change. Welcome to another conversation on climate, coming to you from London Business School's campus at the Old Marlebone Town Hall in London. Today, we had the great pleasure of speaking to Tom Gosling, a 24-year veteran of PwC, who subsequently embarked on a portfolio career with Climate, ESG, and company stewardship at its heart. As senior partner, Tom created PwC's executive pay practice and worked with a wide range of FTSE 100 level firms in the UK and Europe, including frequently acting as a board advisor. By 2019, Tom had been bitten by the climate bug, was running prolifically on the subject, and was undertaking what he termed as his middle-class approach to decarbonisation. It's fair to say that Tom has no time for well-intentioned big frameworks or claims that don't stand up to scrutiny. Instead, our conversation was full of suggestions for how we as individuals and as a society at large can be more effective at getting to a more sustainable world. It was a deeply interesting conversation and one that you won't want to miss. Around 80% of people who listen to this podcast haven't hit the follow button. If I could ask you for a small favour, if you do enjoy our conversations, please do hit that follow button on your app. It would help us in the show more than I could possibly say. Thank you and enjoy the conversation. Well, Tom, thank you so much for coming in to have a conversation with us. Yeah, it's a great pleasure. Brilliant to have you. So um, your career to date has been... Um, Unusual, <laughs> you know, it's been 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 been, been an interesting path. Um, kind of the the image that comes to mind is like a, a flower or a firework. We've got this, this 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 strong stem, and then at some point, like 24, 25 years into a career at PwC, it kind of explodes into kind of lights and colours and lots of different different directions. Uh, could you kind of explain a little bit of, of the of the background to the kind of portfolio <laughs> career there? Well, it's, it's a very <laughs> sort of poetic description of it. I can tell you, Chris, it feels much more prosaic from. Uh, uh, from my side of the fence. But um, yeah, I mean, I, I suppose, um, I mean, I had a great time at, at PwC, never kind of had a reason to leave for most of my professional career there. So yeah, you're right, I had 24, 24 years uh, in the firm. But from the point I became a, a partner there in my mid 30s, I'd always had a, a plan to be in a position to do something completely different when I got to 50. And um, that was something my wife and I discussed. And there were you know, several motivations for that. I mean, one was just personal, you know, just to life can't be all about work. And I'd seen people sort of spat out and exhausted husk at 60, kind of wondering where to go next. But also professionally, I just wanted the freedom to be able to explore a number of kind of different, different professional dimensions as well. And so, you know, the way I see, um, you know, my life now is it's a way of, you know, integrating with, um, you know, a greater focus on, you know, family, friends, personal occupations, also a greater variety of sort of professional um, pastimes as well. So it's been, I had a great time at PwC, but I have to say I've also had a new lease of life since moving into this new phase. Brilliant. And uh, in your portfolio, you've got a lot of um, you know, very different interests, a lot of different positions that, that you hold. Mm. Is there one kind of unifying theme that holds it all together? Yeah, I'm not sure there's one unifying theme. I mean, I guess there are a few things that are kind of consistent because I, I suppose most of what I do falls into a couple of buckets. I do some um, personal coaching work. Uh, I also do some um, consulting work still, and then I have my academic um, interests. And I guess, you know, common themes across all of those are, you know, I still like to feel I'm having an impact in some way, shape or form. I, I don't want to just sit in a room talking to myself. Um, you know, communication is a big part of what I uh, enjoy doing. And I guess most of what I do, as well as sort of touching on aspects of public policy, which I've always been very interested in, do still have a crunchy analytical angle because there's, you know, there's a geek in me that, you know, that loves to get into the spreadsheet and figure out what's going on. And at some point along your your journey, you got bitten by the by the climate bug. By ESG. Yeah. you decided no, this is this yeah. is, this is a focus of yours. Could you talk a little bit about how you know, you're, you're coming to climate? <laughs> yeah, coming to climate. Yeah, <laughs> um, I mean it's an interesting one. I mean I'd always um, you know from you know from the mid '90s really, as the whole debate on climate change you know, was was gaining increasing prominence, I was always aware of it and. 
always sort of somewhat considerate of um, how I kind of sought to live my life. But I mean, candidly, the, the real sort of acceleration of, of what I was doing came through kind of two directions, really. I mean, one was professional. So towards the end of my time at PwC, I was increasingly getting involved uh, in questions of um, investor stewardship, uh, corporate governance, the purpose of the corporation. And that inevitably linked onto ESG issues. There's obviously a connection there. But there was also a personal aspect to it as well. Um, and I think it was, it must have been 2018, 2019, when we had all of the Extinction Rebellion protests going on here. And, and for me, this is actually kind of, you know, my own case is an interesting case study in, in what activism can do, actually, you know, because Extin Extinction Rebellion was going on. We had the kind of the Friday school strikes. You know, my daughters were freaking out about climate change. And, and I, you know, just made me reflect a little bit around what I was doing and was there a way to get kind of a greater sense of agency in this rather than just sort of, you know, throwing my hands up and grinding my teeth and saying how terrible the whole thing is. So that also got me much more interested in issues from a personal perspective. So the, the personal and the professional really came together, you know, about um, four or five years ago um, to make climate a much bigger part of what I do. Brilliant. And uh, just focusing on the personal for a little mm. while before we go going into the professional, mm. uh, you've been. Um, documenting and uh, undergoing yeah. a, a, a family journey yeah. uh, towards uh, with uh, pretty ambitious decarbonisation goals. Do you want to, do you want to talk, talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, so about that same time, I came across a, a pledge um, on some UN website. I can't remember exactly where it is. And the pledge um, suggested that, that, that signatories do a few things. I mean, so um, from recollection, it was first you were meant to calculate your carbon footprint. You were then meant to set a... Um, a time frame over which you would make a target reduction. And I, I, I think they were suggesting 50% over 10 years. I can't quite remember. And then also you were meant to communicate about what you were doing. And so I thought, OK, this ticks a few boxes for me. And you know, it would be kind of fun to start a blog on, on what I'm doing. And so um, I actually set a slightly more ambitious target, which was to reduce carbon footprint by 50% over seven years, which is getting alarmingly <laughs> close now. We're, we're kind of approaching it. And um, yeah, started writing this blog about it, which has actually opened up a whole new sort of, um, you know, part of my life and some fascinating conversations. And, and what was really notable, actually, was when I wrote the first edition of that, um, I was really overwhelmed, actually, by the feedback that I got from people within PwC who really valued seeing someone senior in the firm, you know, openly grappling with these issues. Um, and I've learned an enormous amount through the process. And are we on track for it? I'm not, I'm not quite sure. I'm not quite sure we'll quite get there. It's a little bit more difficult in a couple of areas than I thought. But I think we'll be at, um, I think we'll probably be at 40% actually. Um, somewhere between, between a third and 40%. Um, and who knows, we might sneak over the line. Um, Buy-in from everybody was, was <laughs> unconditional and for that problem? <laughs> well, I mean, this is one of the things that, um, you know, is kind of a little bit challenging about it because, you know, as a family, you've got to do stuff as a family. And, you know, people, we're all complicated and we're all, you know, people talk about, you know, kind of the young wanting more action on climate change. But, but in my experience, kids are quite capable of holding two completely contradictory notions in their heads at the same time without apparently noticing the conflict. And so, you know, that has required, um, yeah, certain compromises, candidly, um, because I'm not going to be kind of an authoritarian saying we're never going to get on a plane again or anything like that. I mean, that would be, I'd, I'd, you know, I'd, 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 I'd lose the audience at that point. I think it's, it's fair to say. Um, so, you know, that's, that's one of the one of the realities that you you, you have to deal with, and, and and right from the beginning, I mean the reason I you know I called my series a middle class approach to decarbonisation, simply because you know I'm not going to go and you know live in a log cabin in the forest eating you know berries, um, and so I am going to live what is sort of a I'm going to live an affluent Western lifestyle. And actually, I thought you know we need different voices in this debate, and I thought well the contribution I can make is to, you know, for other people who want to do something but also aren't going to go and live in the forest, what are some of the things that you might usefully, usefully do? And so that was always the perspective that I was going to take rather than a particularly hair-shirted perspective to it. Brett. 
And what was the biggest lesson that you've you've come up with? If you want to share one one pearl. I mean, there are gosh, there are so so many um, different things. But I mean, one of them, I do think we s slightly overcomplicate some of this stuff, and. Um, you know, and actually, I, mean, I went through a huge effort to calculate my carbon footprint, but I'm not sure I really needed to, and I'm not sure anybody does need to, because when it comes down to it, if you, if you live an affluent Western lifestyle, you know, there are probably four or five things that, that you can do that you have personal agency on over your carbon footprint. And they're, you know, they're how you heat your home, how you get around the place, whether internationally or locally, uh, what you eat, and the type of consumption you undertake. And it, it kind of, for pretty much everybody, kind of comes down to that. And so I think we can maybe do a little bit more to focus on those actions rather than on asking people to calculate a carbon footprint, which probably to 99% of the population is kind of a little bit abstract and, and, and irrelevant. And in fact, I'm slightly surprised that we don't have a little bit more kind of public messaging on this. And I know governments really don't like this sort of nanny statism, but, but actually if you look at people's understanding of it, I mean, very consistently across the world, when people are surveyed, they say, yeah, I'm taking personal action on climate change. And then the follow-up question is, what are you doing? And they say, I recycle. And recycling is you know, not a bad thing to do, right? We should all be recycling. But it's kind of irrelevant when it comes to climate change. So there's clearly this sort of massive gap in understanding about what you need to do. So, so for me, kind of one of the biggest things is actually for people, you know, particularly for moderately well-off people in, in, in Western countries, it's pretty clear what we've got to do. So let's simplify the messaging mm -hmm. around that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and a very important point. There is the, there, there is too much kind of forgiveness of people in their in their lives that oh I recycle therefore I don't need to be yeah. therefore I can fly to New York. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. you know, no, you can't yeah, really. It's, quite you know, it's, up. it's, it's quite not, it's not quite the same. Yeah, put stick on some solar panels and drive yeah, drive, yeah. drive an electric car. Man, you know, maybe yeah, that's yeah. that's a little bit. Maybe then you can get to Chicago or somewhere. You know, that's okay. I suppose the other thing actually, if I'm allowed a second, if I can sneak course, in a second, course, you yeah. ask for one big lesson. But yeah. the other one is actually I, I slightly started off this thinking from a you know. Um, you know, I, I, I grew up a Catholic, so I'm used to the idea of penance, right? <laughs> and so I slightly entered this in, in, in the spirit of, you know, I'm going to have to take my medicine and, you know, I'm going to have to sacrifice. But actually, there's quite a lot of stuff that you can do around climate change that actually not only is not negative, but is actually life enhancing. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, so examples of that, and again, this is going to be very much a sort of a rich world perspective on, on, on this problem, so I need to caveat that. But, you know, people who buy an electric car don't go back, right? They just think it's better. I've just installed a heat pump. It's great. It heats up the house in a much nicer, kind of gentler way. Um, if you eat a more plant-based diet, it's, it's cheaper. You feel better. You know, it's, it's, it's healthier. Um, if you focus your consumption on experiences rather than stuff, all of the research evidence shows that that makes you happier. So, actually, there's quite a lot of this stuff that is very aligned with just living life in a better, more fulfilling, cleaner yeah. way. Um, and again, I think that's something we could perhaps make a little bit more of, that actually this isn't about denying you and stopping you from doing stuff you want to do. And there's going to be a little bit of that, undoubtedly. But actually, there's a lot of this stuff that's just, when we get there, it's better. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and just one, one more to add to that is, um, is, is, is exercise, like walk places. Yeah, yeah. Get, 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 get a bike. You know, absolutely. You feel so much better at the end of the day yeah, if you've yeah. done a bit of exercise. You know, just yeah, some, very some, good point. Things, yeah. So, taking these kind of personal learnings um, mm. from your your experiences of decarbonisation, has that influenced how you feel that um, society at large looks at these issues, like governments and corporations? Mm. How's it all it all, it all linked? Have, has has that experience? Coloured your thinking on other people's experience. I'll just I'll give the one example might be that um, the whole carbon carbon footprint that mm. we were talking about mm. construct from um, British Petroleum. Yeah, yeah. You know, <laughs> you know that's so it as a as an idea of trying to deflect respons Shift the responsibility, you know, responsibility from, 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 from somebody else. Yeah. 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 So I, I think as my my view has sort of developed on this over time. Um, so what's absolutely clear is that individuals can't solve this by themselves and, and I think it's wrong to entirely put the emphasis on individuals and that is part of the reason why I haven't taken an excessively hair shirt approach to this because we have to solve the system. But on the other hand, 
I think the idea that, well, governments have got to solve this, so let's just wait for governments to act, is kind of for the birds as well. That's not how politics works. So I think that each of um, you know, individuals, the corporate and finance sector and governments have a role to play. Uh, I think individual action, and I've certainly found this, individual action and talking about individual action helps to you know, create the circumstances in which this is politically salient. Um, corporate action um, you know, enables governments to see how this can be done without it being too costly and that they're not going to face massive backlash from the corporate community, which is very, very influential in, in, in policy making. That creates the conditions in which government can act. So I, so I think all of this stuff has to go together. Um, and we can't, none of us can just point the finger and say, you've got to do it, you've got to do it. Mm -hmm. Great. And yeah, you suggest there that an individual has influence in all these places. Like, you know, you, you can vote for the politicians. You can, Absolutely. You, know, you, can, you can spend with the companies you feel aligned with. Um, you know, you, can, you, you have some powers to be. We, we have agency to do it. And, uh, but I do, I do think the political saliency is particularly important. And, it, it, you know, if you hit, listen, um, yeah, Chris Stark, the CEO of the Climate Change Committee uh, in the UK, um, you know, I think are doing really great work in, in, in this whole area. It's quite interesting. When, when, when asked about what's the most important thing that individuals can do, he actually says, talk about it. Talk about what you're doing, talk about it. And from this kind of little ripples flow, and that's been one of the really rewarding experiences from communicating about this, that I've discovered all of these connections, you know, people who, you know, dropped me a note saying, I'm just doing a home renovation, really glad I read your blog because I'm now putting in underfloor heating and heat pump, you know, as part of that renovation. Uh, my local MP tabled a couple of parliamentary questions on the back of some of the planning difficulties I had around my heat pump. Yes, yeah, she got the brush off from the department, but I mean, all of these things are just little things that, that keep it salient. Because what we need is, um, if, if just take the UK as an example, we're quite likely to have a change of government in 18 months' time. It's not certain, but if we don't have a change in government, we're going to have the existing government with a renewed mandate. Any new government has enough political capital to do two or three things. What we need to make sure is that action on climate change is one of those two or three things that they feel emboldened to do something about in the, in the first 18 months before it's just all gone to hell in a handcart for them. And so this point of political salience is, I think is really, really critical. So um, moving on to your, um, kind of your core professional um, expertise, mm -hmm. uh, general exe executive pay, pay mm -hmm. and remuneration, uh, the general critique of the area mm -hmm. is that uh, executives, corp you know, top, top corporate executives are overpaid mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. performance is, um, is not affected by overpaying and mm -hmm. you, know, you see all the headlines all the time. What are the main kind of myths that you see that, you know, surrounding this, this whole area? Mm. I mean, I think, yeah, there are a lot of misunderstandings about, um, about executive pay. I'll maybe f focus on what I think is probably the key one, which is this idea that levels of executive pay are just outrageous and completely unjustifiable. Uh, and, you know, and this is a difficult one because, I mean, they're definitely high, right? Because CEOs get paid an awful lot of money. But actually, when you really look at it, um, CEO pay is pretty readily explicable by a number of economic forces that we've seen over the last three decades. Um, and so typical CEO pay has gone up around sixfold in real terms since the early 1980s, and that's compared with typical worker pay of no more than two times in, in real terms. And so that is often taken as sort of face value evidence for the fact that the whole thing's a racket and it's crazy. But the thing that's often missed in that debate is that the value of our largest companies has also gone up around sixfold in real terms over that period. And you might say, well, why does that affect anything, right? Because it doesn't necessarily, just because a company's bigger, it doesn't necessarily make it any more difficult to do the job. And all of that's true. But when you look at pay in scarce skill, um, high stakes kind of occupations, all of the evidence shows that actually it does broadly scale with the size of the organisation and the stakes. So a couple of examples of that. Um, if you, I, don't, I generally avoid sporting analogies when it comes to CEA pay, but in this regard, they're quite helpful. So if you compare Cristiano Ronaldo and George Best, both the greatest footballers of their generation, Cristiano Ronaldo's peak contract at Real Madrid was a massive multiple of George Best's peak contract at Man United. Is it because Ronaldo was a better player? I mean, he probably worked a little bit harder um, than, than, than George Best, 
But the key reason for that is that the Real Madrid franchise was just so much more valuable than the Man United franchise was back then because of the globalisation of sports rights, that actually paying that little bit more for a slightly better player became much more important. And so we saw this explosion in sports wages. It's the same in golf tournaments. If you look in golf tournaments, the uh, earnings, the prize money for the top few golf players has stretched enormously from the distribution lower down the spectrum. So when you get these very kind of scarce skill, high value occupations, you tend to find that you know, an economic consequence of that is that the pay rates you know, kind of scale with the size of the company. So the reason I think this is really important is not to say that these levels of pay are OK, but for us to focus on the right causes for that. Because I think there's been far too much emphasis placed on this idea that it's a market failure. Right? So the response to that market failure has been to give shareholders more and more powers over CEO pay and to have more and more disclosure about CEO pay. And that has had some impact on CEO pay structures, but it's had basically no impact on CEO pay levels at all. And um, really the key drivers around the rise in pay levels have been actually, you know, we've allowed reduced competition, we've allowed agglomeration, the generation of these huge mega corporations, uh, reducing marginal tax rates have also certainly played a role. Um, and so if we want to reverse that, we need to look at some of these root causes and, and, and have different set of policies, whereas actually I think politicians have kind of just tried to shove it off to shareholders. So for me, that's one of the kind of the key myths that it's just this unjustifiable explosion. Actually, if you look at the economics of it, it's exactly what you'd expect from an economic point of view given what has happened to the structure of, of, of corporations. And so that's not particularly to defend the outcome. People have different views on the outcome. But actually, if you don't diagnose the problem correctly, you'll come up with the wrong treatments for it. Mm, interesting. And one of the treatments that you've written quite a lot about, potentially, is the whole concept of responsible stewardship. Um, mm -hmm. Would you care to kind of define that and talk about, talk about it a little bit? Yeah, I mean, obviously there's this massive debate at the moment about what responsible business is and what responsible stewardship um, is. I mean, the way I view it is, is as follows. Um, I think that we have to remember that you know, corporations exist by virtue of rights that have been endowed on them by society. So things like limited liability, the rule of law, these are the things that enable corporations to flourish. And the general purpose corporation that can kind of do what it likes subject to those um, within its corporate form has delivered enormous benefits to society. But I think we must never forget that the purpose of all of this is to produce societal benefits. And therefore, I think it's very reasonable for um, society to place expectations on corporations about how they behave and operate. Um, having said all of that, I'm a little bit nervous about this idea that corporations should be running around solving all of society's problems. I don't think that's realistic. I don't think they have the skills or legitimacy to do that. So for me, responsible stewardship is very much about uh, pursuing the goal of creating long-term value um, through the provision of great products and services um, to, to the world, which is what kind of the corporate sector kind of does. But doing that subject to, you know, kind of the norms and expectations of society that go beyond statement of the law. Uh, and that set of expectations does evolve over time. And, you know, I think we're clearly in a period of time when notions of fairness to the distributions of spoils and so on and so forth have become very germane. So I think that any, any board, any investor thinking about discharging their duties needs to have those considerations in mind as, as they go about their work, rather than just simply saying, oh, you know, that's down to the government to solve, we're just going to, you know, do our business of making, making money. And this is, this is tricky because we need to think about and define the boundaries of that, which is why I think that for the corporate sector on the whole, this does need to be in the service of the kind of unifying long-term goal of, of, of creating value. But it's creating value subject to um, the norms and societal expectations of the day. Mm -hmm. But it's interesting you frame it that way, that um, the long-term goal of um, corporations is to create value. You may be argued that the, that there is no such thing as a long term goal <laughs> for a corporation, and uh, what what management are very much focused on is the next quarter's quarterly performance. 
short short termism. Um, mm. How does how does that uh, the the issue of short termism bump into uh, the issue of, um, of of that type of responsibility? Yeah, and I mean clearly there is a you know there is a tension in in human existence, which is that you know we you know e evolution didn't really prepare us terribly well for you know, thinking beyond the annual cycle of, um, of survival, right? Uh, and, um, and, you know, we know that there are benefits in lengthening our time horizon beyond that. And actually, I mean, sometimes I think it's amazing where as long-term as we are, you know, given, given how we evolved and, and what we grew up um, to deal with. But I think there are a couple of important points to make around long-termism. Um, without denying that it that it can be a problem and it can be a problem in pay systems as well which which maybe we'll come back to but um, the first is that actually by its very nature shareholder value um, you know and I, I'm, I'm not a sort of um, a shareholder value extremist or anything like that but shareholder value is inherently a long-term concept because the value of companies on stock markets um, relies on their enduring ability to create cash flows that, that are valued many years into the future. And although, you know, um, in that kind of valuation calculation, stuff that's beyond 50 years out doesn't really figure, stuff that's beyond 10 years out, you know, really does. And that's why we see the enormous um, valuations put on technology companies that aren't making any money today. And in fact, if anything, some of these long-term factors have become more important and we see an increasing amount of the value of companies being in excess of the value of their kind of current tangible assets kind of created today. So sometimes I think we panic a little bit about, you know, the fact how market, you know, stock markets are incredibly short-term. The other thing that it's a real point that it's important to make is that there is this tension between, on the one hand, you know, we can confuse short-termism versus agility. So in a world that's changing really, really rapidly, there aren't that many environments where it makes sense to take a massive bet on something that's going to happen in 20 years and make 20 years of losses while waiting to get there. And, um, you know, sometimes actually the world changes so fast that there is value in agility and, and in options. And I think we also have to be realistic about in those circumstances where those really long-term bets are value creating and, and can sensibly be made, those are probably gonna be in ownership structures that kind of support that, right? So you might have, it might be, a, you know, a dominant family owner or, you know, a large private owner who really deeply understands, you know, the business. That's probably not going to be the type of business that's appropriate for dispersed ownership by 150 shareholders mm. in public markets. So, you know, sometimes I think we need to be realistic about what type of investments public markets are ever going to make, given that they only have somewhat superficial knowledge of the companies that, 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 that they invest in. Are they really going to trust that this sort of, you know, very, very long term investment, loss making investment? is going to pay off. Sometimes they'll be able to judge that, sometimes not. So that's just a couple of perspectives of it. Sometimes I think we're a little bit harsh on, on public markets in relation to this charge of short-termism. And indeed, I think probably my, my take on it is that more of the problems around short-termism arise from how companies respond to some of those signals as opposed to the market structure itself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, you've hinted up one of the major issues there, though, that um, the targets by and large, are 80, 90 you know, percent met. Yeah. So how challenging really are they? You know, how, and how do you go about fixing that? So what's and, and that's the big problem, I think. And, you know, so we see that the, you, can put, you can put pay targets in sort of three sort of buckets, right? So you have the totally objective, completely ungameable targets like relative total shareholder return, when you compare your market total shareholder return against a peer group of companies. And there's really nothing you can do to influence or, or, or gain that. You then have financial targets like return on capital, earnings per share, where although actually management can have quite a lot of influence over those targets in the short term by decisions that they make around cutting R&D or mm -hmm. what they do about accruals, there is at least strong external investor understanding of those metrics and norms and benchmarks and ideas about how tough they should be. And then you get these set of strategic goals that ESG falls into where there's enormous information asymmetry between 
executives and their board, let alone boards and investors, which means that actually external observers don't really know how tough they are. And what you see consistently in the data is as you go through those spectrum of measures, payout rates go up. And you know, we recently, um, with my old firm PwC, completed a study on climate targets in large European companies. And uh, half of these are paying out at 100% of the maximum. On average, they're paying out at nearly 90% of the maximum. All of the oil majors have paid out on their climate transition targets at over 90% of the maximum. So, so good news, Chris. I mean, we don't need to worry about climate change. We've got it licked. It's, it's OK. Sorted. It's all sorted, so we can rest easy again. Um, how can you overcome that? Um, I think the circumstances in which you can overcome that are relatively limited. But I think they're where you have an ESG issue that's clearly first amongst equals, where there's some measure of an external kind of standard or acceptance or benchmark about what good looks like, and where you have a knowledgeable anchor investor with a big stake who can apply that external scrutiny. So actually, to be fair to Sevian, in their case, those circumstances quite often apply. But we have many other situations where that doesn't apply, and I fear that we're just getting junk metrics put mm -hmm. into plans. And so I think that we need to approach, well, I mean, it's too late, right? The horse is bolting on this. We, we somehow need to make these targets better. But I would have preferred that we gradually evolved and expanded the practice from a core of companies where we could do it really well, because we have all of the opportunities here for a classic executive pay own goal, where in three years time, we found out we've had more pay, but not more ESG. Yeah. Um, that just undermines credibility in the whole executive pay setting system yet again. So can we uh, possibly go on to some, a really interesting area that you, you've done, done quite, quite, quite a lot of work on, particularly back, back in your times in PwC, mm. of uh, distributive justice? Yes. Uh, like pay is clearly, it's an issue of justice. Yeah. So I think what's really interesting about that work on distributive justice is that it makes you realise that we all talk about the importance of fairness, but we all mean completely different things by it. And um, there are various different ways you can think about fairness. You can think about fairness in terms of economic efficiency. You can think of fairness in terms of equality of opportunity. Once you've got equality of opportunity, everything's fair. You can think of fairness of outcomes in terms of just desserts for effort and skills. Or you can think about it in terms of, you know, minimum standards for, for everybody, uh, in terms of um, livability of pay, or you can think about it as equality. And these different definitions are held by different people as being important to different degrees. And actually, what's fascinating is that people's notions of fairness are actually an amalgam of all of these. And that's what this sort of study, study that we did showed. We, we analysed people's responses to kind of structured economic kind of trade-off questions as, as well as some more qualitative questions. And we sort of understood where people sat on these different axes of kind of dimensions of fairness. And people fall into different buckets. Okay, so what? What does that mean for organisations? Well, one of the findings of that piece of research work um, that we did, which was with um, um, Sandy Pepper uh, and Julie Gore of London School of Economics, who are um, uh, both a former colleague of mine at PwC and, uh, and, and an academic philosopher. And what one of the things that we found was that, interestingly, people do expect their organisations to apply principles of distributive justice. So you might think that actually people view their organisations as purely economic entities that should be driven entirely by economic efficiency, and they view society as doing the job of dealing with fairness. But actually, interestingly, they don't, right? They view fairness as being re relevant to organisations. And so what that suggests is that actually organisations probably need to have a point of view on this question. But importantly, they can't assume that all of their people are going to think the same way. And actually, different organisations are likely to have a different um, kind of dominant view on, on this question. Um, and, you know, you might have some organisations that are, you know, very, I mean, if you look at kind of some of the US tech organisations, for example, they've taken very, very market-driven approaches to pay, where everybody's paid differently according to their market value. And that's one view. That's a sort of an economic efficiency, market worth view of fairness. But we also have, you know, cooperatives that 
pay people in a very, very equal way who have a very different principle of fairness. And I think it's one of the things that organizations can think about as they're setting their pay policies. And actually, we did work with some clients off the back of that that led them to developing what they called fair pay charters or similar things, where actually they just try to articulate what they meant by fairness. And sometimes that's about what you do about pay at the top. So there's a very small number of organisations that actually set limits around pay at the top relative to wider workforce pay. But actually more often it leads to considerations about what you do about pay at the bottom. So quite a common outcome from work on these fair pay charters was organisations feeling that actually they needed to get an understanding of what living wages were throughout their population across the world and actually redirect paid budget resources to making sure that everybody at least was, was paid a living wage. In, in other organisations it meant creating equality around kind of benefit provision across the workforce because why should the CEO also get a more valuable pension? You know, it doesn't sort of make sense. They're already paid more. So I think it can be a helpful lens on helping organisations understand the extent to which the way they're operating pay throughout the organisation is congruent with the culture and values that they have. So we're very much in the in the world of kind of, you know, Milton Friedman and, uh, you know, discussion of, you know, the shareholder primacy. Now, and while a lot of what the idea that shareholders should be um, telling the board what to do is, I'm sure it would be very much within his, um, his, his will as well, what, what, what he would want us to do. So I think that one of the things where, where things are different now compared with Friedman's day is that I think he assumed that there was this sort of um, competent government with state capacity that could deal with some of these externalities um, that, that, that business might create. And I think we're kind of in a different world now, both by virtue of the you know, systemic nature of some of those issues like climate change, because of the increased kind of size and, and influence of corporations, the extent to which they're embedded in our everyday lives uh, and globalisation. So I think we're in a place now where governments are increasingly challenged to take the sole initiative on these issues. And I think what I'd like to see, you know, building and developing on his idea of acting in accord with prevailing ethical custom, I'd like to see us develop this prevailing ethical custom that democratic capitalism matters. It's a system that is not a state of nature. It requires nurture and support and our whole way of life depends upon it. And the corporate sector has agency in nurturing and nourishing those institutions uh, as opposed to on occasions undermining them candidly. And I think this is where we need to build on Friedman because I do think we're in a state where the nature of issues like climate change, biodiversity loss, means that corporations need to lean in in a way and investors that enables governments to act rather than just treating government regulation as a kind of exogenous factor that they, you know, that they're kind of regulation takers, they can also have influence on, on regulation making as well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Do you think that democratic capitalism is fit for the purpose of solving these massive global pan cross-border um, international issues such as climate change? Well, you know, it's, it's the old sort of um, Churchill maxim of it's the, you know, it's the worst solution to it other than every other one that's been tried from time to time and I you know and I think that I'm definitely not in the mind to throw out democratic capitalism in you know because you look at any of the alternatives and you shut us so I think we have to make it work but I think you know making it work does imply a slightly different role and attitude from the corporate sector. Um, so I think the last issue that I would like to, to kind of dig into before we, um, we wrap up is the whole idea of uh, fiduciary duty, mm. um, which is like by its nature, it's a, which we've touched on already before. It's a kind of mm. double-edged sword where mm. you've got your short-term um, duties to be maximising income for for your investors right now, mm. um, because well, they can be trading in and out. So, like, why would they care about long term? You know, they can mm. they as long as you get your dividend in now and you what you change your company while you move on. Um, versus the long term of well. All of those cash flows put together is the actual the actual value of the company. So there's there's a an interesting dynamic between that, an interesting tension. Um, and I think a nice way of talking about it might be um, to to dig into the, you know, the Glasgow Alliance, the you know, Financial Alliance for, for Non-Zero, yeah. uh, which was brought out of uh, COP26 Cop, Cop, Cop and Mark, mm. Marconi's um, initiative from COP26, um, which you've been quite critical of. Um, 
I think it, it, it's a good way of, kind of going into the complexities of the, this issue. Do you want to talk about it? Yeah, happy to talk about it. And actually, the first thing I want to say is that um, I, I actually think that initiatives like um, GFANS, the Glasgow Financial Arts for Net Zero, and the Net Zero Asset Managers Initiative, ENZAM, which sits underneath it, I think these are really important initiatives. Because if we go back to what we've been talking about around the role of investors in, in you know, helping support democratic capitalism and creating space for companies to innovate and so on and so forth, I think these, these groupings are really important. I think the bit that I've been a little bit challenging on is the extent to which um, the 1.5 degrees with limited or no overshoot goal has been embedded into those commitments in, in quite a granular way. And um, the reason I've been challenging on that is that, um, and, and let's keep it simple, let's focus on asset managers. Right? Um, uh, asset managers and asset owners indeed are generally managing other people's money, whether it's your client, the asset owner, or whether it's your beneficiary, whether it's a pensions fund member or what have you. And so you have to be managing the money in their interests. And so the big question is whether managing that money to deliver a 1.5 degree outcome is necessarily and automatically in that client's um, interests. And one of the things around fiduciary duty that, is, that has evolved is if you look around the world, fiduciary duty is generally pretty tightly aligned to maximizing returns for the client or investor for the simple reason that that's an objective that you can pretty much establish that everybody agrees on, whereas other non-financial objectives, it's much more difficult to assume that people agree on them, and so those objectives would generally have to be explicitly built into investment contracts and, and mandates. So in the absence of that explicit kind of um, inclusion of a 1.5c goal, can we assume, can we just assume that that's the right goal for everybody, even if we take a long-term investor, like you know, a 30-year-old who's going to retire in 35 years' time and live for another 35 years. And the point is, it's, it's, it's not so easy. It's not so easy because financial markets do a very different job from the kind of political and economic models that, that, that enable us to decide where we want to go on an issue like climate change. So, for example, the decision that 1.5c is the right goal, and by the way, 1.5c with limited or no overshoot actually goes beyond even the stretch goal in the Paris Commitment, but let, let's put that to one side for a minute. That 1.5c with limited or no overshoot goal you know, takes into account the needs of vulnerable people in developing nations, so it treats people equally um, around the world. It treats future generations who have not yet been born equivalently to today's generations. It takes into a, so you tend to use low discount rates when you when you use those kind of decision making. It also takes into account non-financial welfare benefits such as kind of health benefits, not just kind of cash flow benefits. Financial markets do none of those things. Okay, so financial markets are skewed very much towards. Um, yeah, financially material actors in the developing world. They're focused on cash flows, what affects cash flows, not on non-financial impacts. And, um, you know, for a case study in that, look at markets' reaction to COVID, right? There was an immediate fall, but then they bounced back immediately, despite the fact that there were millions of people sick all around the world as a result of it. And also, financial market discount rates are set by the market to intermediate between current and future consumption of people who are generally alive today. And so we should not expect the optimising outcome for financial markets to be the same as the optimising outcome when we look at things from a political economy perspective. And so unfortunately, I mean, I would love it to be different, right? But if it was different, we wouldn't have a problem. We wouldn't have an externality and all of this. The market would already be solving all of this stuff. So the fact is we have this big disconnect, which is what maximises financial returns, even over the really quite long term, is very different from what may be economic from a, from a, a, a social economic um, point of view. And so investors have to be concerned about those financial returns, not the social and economic outcomes. And so even a climate aware investor, for example, needs to kind of ride two horses of on the one hand, you know, thinking about how they can influence the world to be where they want it to be, but also investing for the world as it actually is. To give a very tangible example, if you were really investing for 1.5c world, for 1.5c we need to electrify pretty much everything like now, 
right? So you would be investing in massive renewable energy capacity, you know, massive electrification of home heating, cars, what have you. But if governments don't follow through and create kind of the grid infrastructure to make all of that work, you're going to have a whole bunch of stranded assets if you, if, if you take that view on a 1.5C world. So stranded assets kind of cut both ways. So investors need to have an eye to where the world is actually going, which unfortunately is not 1.5C. I mean, I think that's now a low probability. I know you can, Mark Jacobson can produce a spreadsheet that shows how it's going to happen, how it can happen, but it, that's a spreadsheet, right? I mean, there is not, in my view, a viable socio-political pathway to that. And so investors need to kind of recognise their, their, their role in this. So, so my criticism of GFANS has simply been that the embedding of that 1.5C with limited or no oversheet target in quite a granular way into the commitments is doing a couple of things. It's creating a structural incentive for asset managers to undertake superficial 1.5 degree alignment activity. It's creating an open goal for people who are saying to them, we didn't sign up to this goal because it goes beyond even what is in the stretch goal of the Paris Agreement. And on the other hand, it's opening the industry up to greenwashing accusations because actually, if you look at what they're actually doing, you know, they're not investing in a way that's bringing about a 1.5 seat world. So I think the initiatives are really important, but they've allowed themselves to get distracted by focusing on what is an increasingly unattainable goal in a way that is now not just a rallying cry, but actually becoming problematic for the initiative. Mm -hmm. So just by way of uh, wrapping up, um, it's been a really, really uh, brilliant conversation and we got, uh, we've got covered an awful lot. And one thing in doing the research was really impressed by the, the scope of areas of interest and I uh, think things you've, you've covered over time. Mm. Um, is there something else that you're working on now that you, you might want to want to kind of mention? What, what, what's exciting you now as your, your next area to be? to be? Yeah, I mean, so I think the next one, um, I like controversial areas. So the, the next one I'm interested in is diversity and inclusion. Uh, I've done a little bit of that in the past, and I think it's a, a, a very important issue. And um, the reason why I think it's important is that I think we, again, in some ways analogous to the climate situation, we've had a very big focus on some quite superficial measures of diversity, like board diversity or you know, representational diversity. And I don't think we've focused enough on the flip side of inclusion and what it really means to make um, life for underrepresented groups sustainable when they come into a system that's been largely created and run by and for white men over several decades. And so I think there are some, you know, really hard under-asked questions in there about what effective action on diversity and inclusion means and on, you know, what the research evidence really has to tell us on that. Because again, one of, one of the things, one of my kind of motivating principles in life at the moment is that academia has an enormous amount to bring to practice and to policy but there's often too much of a gap between the two. And so a lot of what I do is try and create a bridge. And so, yeah, that's probably my next, great. The next topic on which I'm going to annoy people. Yeah, great, great. We'll look forward to that with, with great interest. Yeah. Cool. And uh, the last words, uh, we generally ask for um, our, our guests to, to give, a, give a piece of advice. So in this case, if we're you know, anybody who's, who's watching or listening uh, is mm -hmm. considering a portfolio career, um, particularly people who what's the natural audience of this would be people who, um, mm. who, who've got an interest in climate or ESG. Mm. Uh, what advice would you give them? Yeah, so um, it, it depends where you are, right? I mean, so if you're already in, in, in a job, um, you know, it's about looking for the opportunities adjacent to what you're doing today that enables you to, you know, kind of craft your role. So people quite often come to me and say, I want to get into ESG and I want to completely kind of change career. That's frankly often pretty difficult to do. But often there's a surprising amount to which you can turn or use your discretionary effort to turn your existing role and job to, um, you know, to your new areas of interest. The other thing is to um, just create some small experiments and networks. So, you know, get involved in 
some you know industry projects around climate or, or ESG. Um, you know, attend some conferences, build some networks with some academic institutions. I spent many, you know, three years sh of shoe leather, you know, building connections with people. And surprising stuff comes out of that. Start talking about what you're doing, your interest. Use LinkedIn to talk about your interest and connect with people that way. So I think this whole thing around experimentalism, but also an element of incrementalism, don't necessarily look for that big bang change that's going to solve all of the problems. But think about how you can take continuous steps forward all of the time to develop your interests, connections, and, and um, work areas. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Dan. Thoroughly enjoyed it. It's been it. a great pleasure. Great. Thank you very yeah, much. Great. Well, thank you very much for uh, joining us on that conversation. Uh, we hope that you enjoyed it. Uh, we hope that you uh, learned something. Uh, if you did enjoy it, please feel free to leave a five-star review and uh, to subscribe to, uh, to any of our channels. And uh, we'll be sure to keep you updated on future productions. This series is produced by United Renewables in collaboration with the London Business School Alumni Energy Club.